If you have your Bibles, just so you can stay seated, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 is where I'm going tonight. It says, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. He's talking about you guys. You're coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices accepted or acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Amen? I'm going to start, I don't know, um, we're going to go through the next several weeks, um, and I, I'm going to start this series, I don't know how long I'm going to go with it, but we'll just see what the Lord says, but I'm going to start a series that I'm going to call Uncomfortable. Look at your neighbor and say, it's going to get uncomfortable. <laughs> uncomfortable. And... Um, we're just, we're going to talk about some stuff, okay? Hang in. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, anybody heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a priest in Germany during the rise of Hitler. And Dietrich was part of a group of Let me, let me be careful. You guys do understand history. This is history. Larry's not making this up. Hitler was able, by and large, to bring the nation of Germany to their knees using the church. You understand that. He, he, he preached or he uh, demanded nationalism, and he demanded that churches salute the flag and pledge allegiance to the flag during their worship services and people were infiltrated with a an ideology that God loved Germany more than he loved anybody else yeah it's already uncomfortable right <clears throat> and um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a priest who refused to join in now, I'm not telling you that Dietrich did everything right because he was also part of a plot to assassinate uh, Hitler. Um, but one thing that Bonhoeffer did was um, he refused to allow that to happen in his church on his watch. And he wrote books, and his, his books are p very powerful. He was ultimately killed um, in, in prison for his... They called it treason um, because of his stance against Hitler and what he was trying to do in that and for the plot to uh, have him killed. He, he ultimately paid with his life. But he wrote books and writings before he died. And in one of his writings, he said this. He said, those who love their dream of a Christian community more than they love the Christian community itself become destroyers of the Christian community, even though their personal intentions may be honest, earnest, and sacrificial. So when people begin to love their dream of what they believe Christianity is more than they love the Christ of Christianity, we become destroyers of the very thing that we say that we love. Am I making sense? Early, or are you still? All right. So I'm, I'm sure tonight that if, if given the project of coming up, if I were to ask everybody to take out a sheet of paper and write down, list as, as many items as you wanted to, and you come up with your dream church, and I ask you to write down everything that would be a part of your dream church, most of us could handle the task of describing exactly how the church of our dreams would look. Right down to the paint and the flooring. Because we are opinionated people. <laughs> right. 
That's why, listen, you don't have to like this. I'm just telling you, this, this is the truth. This is how I'm structured here. That's why we don't vote on stuff here. Voting divides people. Don't believe it? Look at our nation. Voting divides people. And the church is not a place where I get to vote on what I think is my preference. But that's what most of us could do. We could sit down, me included, I could sit down and tell you uh, what my dream church looks like. And I have to tell you this, to be honest with you. My dream church looks not much like the one I'm pastoring. In fact, this church is uncomfortable for me. There's, there's, there's things that arise in the life of this church that are uncomfortable for me. Because there's things that arise in the life of this church that go against the grain of everything that's been poured into me all of my life. And I'm having to try to figure out where my place is and what my role is in that. And um, I, I, met with, um, I met with Bishop Miller Today, just he and I alone for about two and a half hours, and he just kind of poured some stuff into me, and I poured out to him. And I was telling somebody earlier that, um, like a lot of you come here because you feel like this is a safe place. I go to him because I feel like it's a safe place where I can, I can speak freely about some things that I'm facing and some things that I'm carrying and I, and I don't feel like I'm going to be judged or I feel like if I'm wrong, I'll be told, hey, you're kind of crazy there. Uh, but, but I feel like it would be done in the right way. You understand what I'm saying? And so I had some things that are, were on my heart and I, and I just wanted to speak to somebody and I had asked several weeks ago if I could meet with him and he was gracious enough to give me a little bit of time and so I drove there today and spent some time with him but as I began to talk to him, um, there's a couple things, and I already had my message ready. You can ask my family. I, my, my message was ready yesterday because I knew I wasn't going to be around today. But there were some things he said that I'd like to tell you that fit in with what I'm talking about. And, and he began to, I began to explain to him, man, I got these situations going on in our church bishop, and man, I got this happening, and, and, and I want to know, am I handling this the right way? I want to know, am I approaching it the right way? I just, I don't, I don't want to be responsible for leading people in a wrong direction. I don't want to be responsible for, for, for not saying what needs to be said or for, or for saying things that don't need to be said. And, and I just want you to speak into my life, and I want to I tell you about some things that are going on. And, and, and uh, you know, sometimes we kind of get in these bubbles where we think that what's happening in our world is that. That's the only place it's happening. So what I was really thrilled about was when, he, when I told him some of the things that were on my heart and he looked across the table at me, he said, we got the same things happening at the gate. And I was good right then. I could have just got up and walked out and said, hey, man. And, uh, you know, because if they're having the same things that we're having here, then, then okay, I, I'm feeling a little better already. But we, we began to talk about it, and he said this. He said, Larry, what you have to understand is he said, you and I, there's only 10 years difference between Bishop and I, but he said, he said, you have to understand that you and I were trained up as pastors and leaders. We were trained to lead churches in a world that no longer exists. The, 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 the world that I'm pastoring in right now looks nothing like the world that I was raised in. Nothing like it. I'm telling you, none of you would have been welcome in my church uh, that I grew up in. None of you. No, you wouldn't. No. You, you didn't speak in tongues. You wouldn't have been welcome. That's, you, you, no, no, try to make a place, Vicky. You would not have got in. Vicky always trying to get in. She, just kidding. That's right. Just, but the the way the, it looks nothing like what it was, and 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 I'm telling you the things that I that I'm faced with in 2019 as a pastor. Yeah. 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 Hallelujah! A little more of that, Jason. And uh, and there's like, and I'm trying to 
work through all of this. And so I'm, I'm sitting there, and, and, and Bishop said this to me today. He said, he said, Larry, he said, you, you have to understand this. He said, God didn't call us to be his policeman. I said, okay, thank you. And he, he said, and he said, it's not our job to, you, you and I as pastors, it's not our job to run around checking up on people, making sure they're following all the rules, doing all those kinds. He said, that's not our job. He said, our job is to preach the word of God. And he said, I don't know about you. This is exactly what he said to me. He said, but I don't know about you, but I want to have the freedom to preach the word of God in my church and love the people who are responding to that word. I want to be able to preach the word without them getting mad and without other people outside of my church calling me liberal and, and, and not believing anything. He said, because I want to be able to, to speak the word of God in such a fashion that people begin to understand that the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is all about transformation. And transformation for every person doesn't happen overnight. So people have to continually be exposed to the gospel in order for the gospel to change them. But if they can never come to where the gospel is being preached, then they, they aren't ever exposed. And then he, he went a little further and he said this. He said, you have to understand that the, the Bible, he said, the Bible declares, watch this, this is kind of cool. He said, the Bible declares this in Corinthians. It says that, that Christ died for all. Watch. So everybody is worthy because he died for all. He said, so now he's, this is this why I love Bishop. He just starts stretching your mind over ham and eggs. He starts stretching your mind. And he says, so if Christ died for all, then the scripture also says that then all died. If Christ died for all, the scripture says then all have died. He said, so there are only two kinds of people in the world. There, you're either dead or you're alive. And you're dead or alive to one of two things. You're either alive to Christ and dead to sin or alive to sin and dead to Christ. And he said, if people are coming to your church and they are, they are declaring uh, and, and professing that they, are, that they are born again, he said, then here's, here's the struggle. He said, the, the scripture in Corinthians also said that Paul said, we have determined that we will no longer look at men according to the flesh. Because one time, Paul said, one time we looked at Jesus like that and we missed him being the Messiah because he didn't look like what we thought he should look like. We missed the fact that he was who he said he was. So now then, because we missed that big deal, we will no longer look at men according to their flesh. He said, we, he said Larry, you have a responsibility to get up and preach to people not about their condition, but about their position. He said, because watch this, he said, if people profess to be born again, he said, then the only alternative, then the only answer to that is they are alive in Christ. And he said, so watch this, he said, so if people struggle, think about this, if people struggle, man, I'm telling you, just got this revelation today, it was so awesome. If people struggle, he said, struggle is proof of life. Dead people do not struggle. So if somebody is struggling with something, it's proof that at least they're alive. And, and, and he said, so our churches aren't going to look like they looked in the 80s. He said, and you and I have to teach our people. He said this. We have to teach our people what it looks like to be a safe place. He said, and then... We have to start speaking. He said, because everything really boils down to identity. And then he dropped this wisdom on me, and I'm done with his, and I'll get into my stuff. But he dropped this wisdom on me. He said in Mark, I think the fourth chapter, second or fourth chapter, where the people tore the roof off to get the paraplegic down in front of Jesus. Go check me out on this. Jesus made a statement to that man that he had never made anywhere prior to that or after that to anyone else. And the Bible says the man was brought to Jesus by four friends. By four friends. What you need to understand is that 
according to Jewish custom, if a person was a paraplegic, wounded, crippled, deformed, not able to take care of themselves, they were not the responsibility of their friends. Their family was supposed to be responsible for them. The, the fact that this man's friends and not his family brought him to Jesus is probably indicative of the fact that his family abandoned him. And so this man is coming to Jesus, abandoned by family, no one to rightfully take care of him. And Jesus says something to this man that he said to no one before or no, not anyone after. And he looked at this man, and the first thing he said to him was, son. Before Jesus ever healed his body, he confirmed his identity. Come on, somebody. I don't, think it, I don't think it's settling in on you just yet. Before he ever healed his body, he confirmed his identity and called him son. And he told the one who had been rejected, you're no longer rejected to the family. You didn't have a family, but now you have a family. And now that you have a family, take up your mat and walk. You've been healed and go and sin no more. Because it was only until the man understood that he was accepted and in a family that he had the power to get up. And, and so I, I begin to think about, like, I, I begin to think about our, um, the, way we, the way we do church. And I begin to think about, like, what our ideal church would look like, who we'd let in, who we wouldn't let in, how it would all work out. And I think Bonhoeffer hit it pretty much dead on when he said that even though our efforts may be honest, earnest, and sacrificial, when our dream for the church matters more than our love for the lead of the church, the head of the church, Christ, we ultimately destroy those who make up the community called the church. I don't have a lot of time, so just let me hurry. For a lot of us, church has become, especially in Western culture, church has become a have it your way. We kind of got a Burger King. That won't mean anything to anybody that's under 35. But when I was a kid, Burger King's commercial was have it your way, have it your way. Cut the pickles, cut the lettuce, special orders don't upset us. That was, their, that was their song. You can have it your way because until Burger King came along, if you went and ordered a hamburger at a fast food place, you got it however they made it. But Burger King came along and said you can have it your way. That mentality has shifted into the church. And we have become, watch, we have become a nation of consumers rather than producers. At some point in America, it became more convenient and less costly to consume stuff than to produce stuff. And because we wanted stuff and we wanted it at our convenience, we violated the earliest principle of the word of God when God told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. In other words, what God was telling Adam and Eve in the beginning was be producers. And if we could ever really understand that structure and the plan that God intended, it would do away with a lot of silly arguments and about rights and choices and everything else that people want to scream about in churches. Because if producing was God's intention, then we would understand that anything that I'm involved in, including relationships or whatever else that I'm involved in, that does not have the ability to be productive or reproductive, those things are outside of God's preferred purpose for my life. Because life in Christ never was, never has been and never will be only about what I want and what I think is good for me or for what for what fits my wishes and desires life in Christ was me dying to my wants and coming alive to his wants and producing his kingdom not my own desires am I making sense so the reason I want to preach and teach this is because I'm becoming more and more on a daily basis turned off by how we approach life and relationships and community within the body of Christ. That, that got quiet. <laughs> Stephan, they all went to sleep on me right there. But I'm... It, it disturbs me how we... And when I say we, I'm talking about church. I, I like to think, I would like to think that the refuge is beyond this, but I, I realize probably a little bit of this here. But it, it disturbs me how we approach relationships 
and community within the body of Christ. I was listening to, uh, I, gave, I gave a book to a bunch of our leadership a couple, several months back, and it was a book by Bob Goff called Everybody Always. Just phenomenal book. And his whole premise, Bob Goff uh, spent 36 years as a lawyer, but decided that he was made for more than that. And now then he goes to Uganda, he goes to Afghanistan, he has an organization called Love Does, and he goes all over the world and he builds schools for children, and he just loves on people because he believes that all people, no matter where they are, what country they come from, what the color of their skin is, that all people have value. And um, I was listening to a podcast uh, of his as I was driving home today, and he said something in that podcast talking to somebody else, but he said something in that just stuck in my brain. And he said this today. He said, I want my love for people to dwarf my opinions about them. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I want my love for people to dwarf my opinion about them. I, 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 want, I, don't, I don't want to be looking at people after the flesh. Because if I'm going to look at people after the flesh, man, if, I, if I'm just going to, if, if, if my relationship with you is going to be based on what I see and what you're showing me, then you and I probably aren't going to get in relationship because what I'm going to say is, man, I don't like everything about that. And see, what has happened in churches, church has become a place to where we have tried to create a homogenous society where there's only people just like us. And if anybody comes in that's not like us, then it's uncomfortable. And we would rather drive them out than deal with the uncomfortableness that comes in trying to live and worship in community because everybody deserves a chance at Jesus. But it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. Listen, it's uncomfortable to worship at this church. You people get on my nerves sometimes. You do. Man, I, I want to sometimes, like, sometimes, listen, there's a lot of things that have happened in Larry's life that have changed Larry. But every now and then, oh, Larry rises back up. And every, every now and then, I, I nurse old Larry. And, and old Larry rises back up. And, and there's days that I'm very patient with a lot of you. And then there's days that I don't really say this to you. I say it by myself when I'm kicking and screaming and nobody's around. But why can't they get it? Because if they just get it, my life would be simpler. Oh, look at there. It's all about me. Hello? Are you seeing what I'm saying? So I don't, I don't want people to come in here that are different than me because as long as everybody comes that's like me, we won't ever have any uncomfortable feelings. We can kumbaya. And so, man, the Lord has just been, really been working on me. And, and I've sat for a few days this week. Um, I didn't get to go today because of my prior commitment, but I've sat for a few days this week in different churches in our community as we've observed Holy Week. And by the way, I was wrong on Sunday. So if you've been showing up at the wrong places on Holy Week this week, that was my fault. I'm sorry. I tried to put out a Facebook post to correct myself. Uh, and tomorrow it'll be at Waples. So if you want to go, it'll, it's tomorrow uh, at noon. And sorry about all that. I did try to correct myself. Um, but, uh, but, uh, I've sat in services this week and the celebration of Resurrection Holy Week and what has struck me by and large is that whatever the location for that particular day's service, whichever church is hosting that day, there's a contingency of people who belong to that local body who are present on that day. But then the next day when the event moves to a different church, those people don't make the trip. And so whatever church... And see, I'm not connected to any of them, so I just show up at all of them. <laughs> and we've had a pretty good contingency of people from the refuge going this week. So we're like the homeless people, man. We just, we just wandering around wherever there's lunch. Hallelujah. Showing up. 
There's those people from the refuge. Yeah, we, we know where a good meal is. We're coming. Hallelujah. <laughs> hey, hey, Larry, can we have this at your church next year? Nope. Ain't got a kitchen. <laughs> but we're happy to keep coming here. So, so, um, so what, I, what I've noticed, in, you know, is, and Rosanna, and I have said this for years about simpler things. But listen, every time somebody has a baby shower, it's not always convenient for Roseanne and I to make an appearance. Or if we get invited to a birthday party, it's not always convenient. Because people, people do crazy things. They plan a birthday party on Saturday at 2 o'clock. That is right in my nap. I'm telling you, if you know me, you know that's my nap time. And, and y'all can laugh if you want to. I'm an old brother, man. I can't go like I used to go. And, and if you plan something at 3 o'clock on Sunday, that's my nap time. But what we have discovered over our life is if we want people to show up for our stuff, it's, it's politeness and courtesy to show up for other people's stuff. And if we're not going to show up for other people's stuff, then we can't get mad when people don't show up for our stuff. And, and what we've done in church, see, we've treated church just like that. Because, well, I did my part when it was at my church, and it's too inconvenient to go to another church. And besides, that's really not the way I worship, and they don't sing the songs that I like, and I don't scri- subscribe to the way their preacher does things. So I'll just stay away because today it's not my brand. Hello? So we treat the body of Christ the same way we treat our social media pages. We follow who we like and unfriend who we don't. We attempt to build our world with only the things that we like in it. We want to force everybody to see it our way and subscribe to our way of thinking. And if they don't, then we want to remove them from our lives. Right? And if the truth be told, most of us w- wouldn't mind removing the people who don't agree with us completely from the face of the earth because after all, it would just be a much easier place if only those who agree with us were allowed to live. <laughs> Hello? Come on, let's be, let's be real. That kind of stuff's become toxic in our culture. It's become toxic in our culture. You have have factions of people in our culture right now fighting for rights and fighting for recognition and, 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 and fighting to be noticed and fighting to be seen and fighting to be legitimized and all these other kind of things. Everybody's fighting for something. But it's amazing to me whether it's the right or whether it's the left. Doesn't matter which side it's on. Neither side is tolerant of the other. The left says that the religious right is not tolerant of them. Hello? And then (laughs) the other side says they won't even let Chick-fil-A in the airport. (laughs) And, And so now then, what I hated in that side, I'm doing the same thing on this side. Come on. And, and we perpetuate these things because what we would all like is for everything to be the way. Am I making any sense here now? Are you okay? I want everything to be the way that I want it to be. And I only want to see what I want to see. So because that's the way we live our lives, that's the way that many of us have approached the church. If I go to church and it stops catering to my desires and it stops catering to my wants, if the pastor happens to say something with which I disagree, it doesn't matter that he said 99 things that I agree with. If he says one thing that I'm not in agreement with, if the praise team sings one song that I don't like, if the children's department asks my child to stop writing on the wall, 
walls and permanent marker. If the youth leader asks for a little respect so they can teach a class all the way through, if I don't get assigned to that committee, if I don't get asked to be on that team or that board or hold that position in the church, I'm just going to move on because, Larry, there's a dozen other options in town. And so what we've done is we've created an atmosphere to where it's what I want. And I'm only going to go where I'm getting what I want. One of the best definitions I've heard concerning consumerism is this. Watch this. Consumerism is chronic dissatisfaction. I love that definition. Consumerism is chronic dissatisfaction. Because I'm not happy with what I have, so I need the next new thing. Mom, man, cell phones are a perfect example. You, you have a perfectly good cell phone. And look, it was cool years ago when they were flip phones. Those were cool because you could hide them in your pocket. Now then we're carrying 8 by 10 tablets on our belt. <laughs> right? And I got to have the next new thing because I'm chronically dissatisfied. The grass, the, 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 we're always looking for more and better. The grass is always greener on the other side. You have that slide? Fallon sent me this earlier in the week, She's, or sent it to me on Sunday. She said, Pastor, I think this describes where our church is headed, and she meant it in a good way. She said, when the grass looks green on the other side, it may be the Holy Spirit telling you to water the grass you're standing on. She said, Pastor, I think our church is getting a hold of this vision that, that the dream is not somewhere out there. It's right here. And if I can water the grass that I'm standing on, if I can plug in here, whatever ministry that I think I'm seeing going on somewhere else that I'm jealous about, hey, if that's my passion, why not plug it in right here? Start it here. Well, you know, in order for me to start a ministry, I need to have at least 2,500 followers. I'd have never started a church with that. Come on. You, you wouldn't be here on Wednesday night because where's Virginia? There's Virginia. Virginia and I came on Wednesday nights when there was four and three. Anybody else here when we did that? Raise your hand, Virginia. Me and you the only ones. Where were all of y'all? somewhere else but you know what she and I kept being faithful till more of you started showing up because if you want to see something it's not always somewhere else come on come on come on come on I, I think the idea of approaching church from the standpoint of it being here to meet all of my needs is a real misrepresentation and misunderstanding of what it means to be the body of Christ church shouldn't be about being perfectly understood and met in my comfort zone watch this that's not what church is about. Church should be about understanding God and meeting him where he is. Are you okay? Almost done. I don't need everybody to agree with me in order to enter the same building at the same address at the same time in order to be able to worship God. I don't, I don't, if everybody agreed, we'd never have to have awkward moments and uncomfortable hard conversations. If everybody agreed all the time, we'd never be forced to be confronted with some of our own prejudice and biases. I love, man, here's what I love. We had 24-hour round-the-clock prayer. We got 250 people here in this church. All we needed was 24 slots filled up. I'm not complaining, I'm just trying to show you an example. We had some people that took two and three slots because we didn't have enough. But then on Friday, one of the newest people around here, this guy sitting right over here. Don't don't anybody look at him right now, but <laughs> Stefan sends me a message on Facebook and he says, Pastor Larry, I can't remember there were a few open time slots. Is there a time that I could come pray? And watch this. I told him, I said, Stefan, the only two Slots available are 10 and 11 on Saturday morning, and I need to tell you right now that I have a funeral in the building at 11. So you're going to be pushed back to a back room. It's going to be kind of probably funky and weird because there's going to be people in here paying homage to the dead. And... But those are the two times that we have available. And Stephen shot me back a message, and he said, I'll gladly be there. And, and he, he came. What do you... 
What are you saying? What are you saying, Larry? I'm, I'm saying, man, when it's all about like my comfort, my convenience. Woo, man, it's quiet in here. Lord, help me, Jesus. But see, I, I, need, I need to learn to understand that sometimes church is uncomfortable. I've tried to tell these guys, listen, when we opened our house down there, I tried to tell them, listen, you put, you put 10 guys coming off of, out of, out of the life of drugs. First of all, you put 10 guys who've not ever used drugs in the same house together. That's a, that's a, that's a, I mean, that's a whole deal in and of itself because guys stink. Come on, ladies. Hallelujah. I know some of you think sweat is sexy, but it stinks. Hallelujah. And, and when you get 10 of them in a building and not much ventilation, hallelujah. I remember, I remember we hadn't been going very long. We had a room full of guys down there, and it was, it was the first time we had a full house, and somebody pulled me aside, and they said, Pastor Larry, can, can you get us some plug-ins or something? <laughs> True story. Roseanne and I went and bought a bunch of plug-ins, took down there. I don't know what they're doing now. They're just enjoying the smell. I, guess. I don't know. <laughs> Because it's been a long. But I tried to tell those guys, when, listen, when you move 10 guys in together that have been used to doing their own thing, living the way they want to live, everything is not going to be comfortable. But sometimes being put in uncomfortable circumstances forces you to face some things that you probably wouldn't have any other way. It's the same way in the church. Hey, listen, how many of you understand this? We're not all going to come to church for the rest of our lives and none of us ever be upset with one another. But what we have to learn to do as church members is learn how to constructively and instructively talk about the things that offend us and hurt us so that we don't keep those things buried down, but so that we can get them out in the open so that there will be life in the house so that people will be able to come in and breathe the fresh air of the anointing of the Spirit of God. Sit in the place where you can run, hide in rooms here and whisper. Because that Robert Burton. I don't even know why Larry lets him come to this church. Well, the same reason we let you come. Because that brother needs it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right? Come on. It may be uncomfortable sometimes. Hey, listen, this, this is the cool thing about this church. We got people that come to church here that don't even like each other. Truth. I'm not looking at anybody. <laughs> we got husbands and wives that come to this church that don't even like each other. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. I feel the preacher now. Hallelujah. Yeah. Come on. So, so, what, so what does that mean, Larry? Does that, that mean I need to go find a place where everything fits my, my list? No, 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 no. What you need to do is, listen, Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, if I had never joined a church till I found one that was perfect, I should never have joined one at all. And the moment I did join it, I have, if I had found one, I would have spoiled it. For it would not have been a perfect church after I had become a member of it. Still, imperfect as it is, the church is still the dearest place on earth that we can gather and offer worship to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. Listen, this is about more than my preferences and your preferences. This is about people's lives being changed for the kingdom and the glory of God. So get over yourself. Brett McCracken says that he wrote a book and he said that what most of us think we want from church is almost never what we really need. It's not about finding a church that perfectly fits my theological, architectural, political preferences. He said it's, like, it's, it's about, and this is why I use 1 Peter, he said it's about becoming living stones that are being built up as a spiritual house focused on and held together by Jesus who is the stone that the builders rejected who became the cornerstone of the whole thing. Commitment, even among discomfort. Faithfulness, even when I'm disappointed. I, I'm going I'm to tell you a little story I'm done. But I referenced this. I, I did Virginia's testimony last night, and I referenced this situation. We didn't get all into it. But 
Virginia had invited somebody to church one time, and they came, and it kind of, they, they, they came and they had high ideals about, they were from another church, and they were going to come in here and help us get straight, I think, <laughs> whatever. And um, it became a really awkward situation, and I probably didn't handle it right. Well, I know I didn't handle it right. I know I didn't. And because I didn't handle it right, I hurt, I hurt the, the woman's feelings, and I hurt Virginia's feelings in the process. And I remember Virginia coming to me, and she sat in my office, and she said, Pastor, I've been telling everybody about how awesome our church is. And then when they come, this is what happens. Oh, I remember that all those years ago. And I vowed then, way back then, okay, I'm, I'm going to be better. And I'm going to be more aware. And I'm going to realize that just because things are uncomfortable doesn't give me the right to hurt people, even if I wasn't intending. Am I making any sense here? But the thing that I love about Virginia is that even though she was disappointed, and I'm sure, like, she's never directly told me this, but it's okay now you can tell me this, but I'm sure she was disappointed in me as a, as a leader, somebody she was looking to for spiritual direction, and I'm sure she was disappointed in me, but even in her disappointment, she, she stayed connected. She, she continued to come. And that's what it's all about because what being the people of God has always been about is that commitment when I'm uncomfortable and that faithfulness even when I've been disappointed. What would have happened if, if God would have bailed out on Israel the minute they said or did something offensive to him? Think back in the Old Testament. Think how many times Israel shook their fist at God. So what if God would have said, I've done, I'm done with you Israelites. I'm going to, how about, how about the Canaanites? How about the Philistines? How about the Egyptians? No. Because God's not as fickle and restless as we are. God has covenant faithfulness to his people. Even when the relationship is difficult, even when the relationship is embarrassing. I've had people leave this church and I just, it, that church is embarrassing. Hey, you sing into the choir now. <laughs> you telling me it's embarrassing, right? I, man, I know we got man. Our, man, our stuff gets put out everywhere, including the Herald Democrat. <sighs> Come on, the judges know me on a first name basis down at the Grayson County Courthouse. The jailer knows me. I go in so often to visit people. You, you want to talk? Listen, I know sometimes our mess is embarrassing, but God is never turned off by our mess because he doesn't see our condition. He sees our position. And he says if you keep telling them about who they are, they'll come out of what they're doing. Adam McHugh. Come on, Leland. I'm done. Thank you, sir. Adam McHugh said, we must put away our convenient notions of God. The one who always agrees with us, the one who always favors our nation, our political agenda, and the one who feeds us candy and never vegetables. We've got to put our notions away about a convenient God. Sometimes God is uncomfortable. Sometimes God asks me to love people who make me uncomfortable we, we've created a culture in the American church for many years now where people are fans of God but they're not followers of God yeah I like that God he's pretty good he's got some good stuff to say well then let's follow him nah he walks in some shady neighborhoods so I'm a fan but I'm not a follower See, because when you're a follower, you follow him even through the parts of the word that are uncomfortable to the way that you are living your life. Come on. 
the number of people in America who are calling themselves followers of Christ according to Pew Research is shrinking on a yearly basis. And I'm going to argue with you that that's a good thing. Larry, how can that be good? Less people are saying that they're following Christ. Christianity's collapsing. No, Christianity's just being clarified. And all the pretenders are being exposed. And Jesus says, they're leaving. You want to go too? And the disciples said, to whom would we go? Because only you have the words to eternal life. So wherever you go, Jesus, even if it's uncomfortable, I'm going to follow you. Even if the way I'm living my life is contrary to what your word says, if I have to make adjustments and changes, I'm going to follow you. It may be uncomfortable. It may cost me something. But listen, David said, I will not offer to God what cost me nothing. And I'm not telling you you can pay for grace. You understand, we, we, come on. I shouldn't have to even say that. We're not buying any. That's not what we're saying. But sometimes following him comes at the cost of not being comfortable. And I don't know about you, but I want him more than I want my own way. Amen. Come on, stand with me here tonight. Woo. Somebody, I heard somebody just lean over and ask their partner, how many weeks did he say this series was going to be? Let's put it on our calendar to come back when it's over. Because this is uncomfortable. Come on, guys. We need to be the church. Not the fake church. Not the whitewashed tombs that have been washed on the inside but full of dead men's bones on on, on the outside but full of dead men's bones on the inside. That's not what we want. We want to be real even if it's uncomfortable. Even if it's stinky. Come on. Jesus called, yeah. Jesus called Lazarus to life. And Lazarus responded to the call to come to life. But Lazarus was still in a struggle because he was still in grave clothes. And Jesus said, I did my part. Now come on, church. Loose him so that he can go free. But if we as a church are afraid to touch them who have responded to the call to come to life, they'll hop along bound never experiencing the freedom that God intended for them to experience. I want to be a church of freedom. Amen. All my hope and all my hope is is in Jesus. Thank Thank God God my yesterday is gone. All my my sins are forgiven. forgiven. shine upon you. May the rest of your week be filled with the joy that comes in knowing that Jesus is for you and not against you. I bless you tonight in Jesus' name. If you're you're a, a man and want to go with us, come on, girl. 
If you want to go with us uh, to the movie on April the 30th, um, see Michael. Get your name on the list. The Lord bless you. We'll see you on Sunday, Easter Sunday. Come on, Resurrection Sunday, 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. We'll see you there.